Hey, hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, it's Sam Knock, and I'm here at my um, humble spot. Oh, see, we got some people jumping on. Hey. So, yeah, uh, thanks for jumping on. And real quick, I think Eddie will be joining in any second. And I just want to, again, shout out uh, Making Pop Music, kind of where this uh, started uh, from, the thread that kind of got this going. So, and Austin and those guys are doing really cool stuff, kind of uh, moderating that board and giving us kind of a platform to like discuss stuff there and stuff like that. So that's been really awesome. And then uh, also just wanted to throw in too, um, so making pop music and also I'm gonna do like a shameless plug since, <laughs> since I got the mic right now. But I am so excited that I've been starting to record a podcast um, that is on this very topic, what we're going to be talking about today. And it is a podcast called Where the Song Fits. And the whole concept of the podcast is on licensing and sync. So we're going to be looking at on that podcast, um, interviewing uh, music supervisors, uh, artists that have had success with sync, like an Eddie Wool, who will be sharing with us in just a minute. And then also uh, the middle companies like licensing uh, agents or, the, or boutique licensing companies that are playing as the middle people. So I'm going to try to, in this podcast coming up, kind of revolve between um, those three things and have a bunch of interviews and um, a little bit of my backstory. I've been doing music for 22 years and um, kind of went from uh, doing recording and engineering and mixing um, to uh, doing a little bit more co-writing and producing and so just kind of um, as the years have gone by I got a little bit more interested in in licensing music and how that worked some of it came from uh, artists that I was working with started landing some like kind of big stuff like uh, a Super Bowl commercial and um, some big TV shows and just in realizing, oh, wow, some music that I mixed or recorded or worked on is out there, you know, making it on television and stuff like that. It kind of drew me to educate myself and learn more about it. But having said that, I feel like I'm still a student. I feel like I'm constantly learning. And guys like Eddie have been great um, just uh, in kind of my education. Uh, so I met Eddie a couple years ago and I've had some great phone conversations with him. I've had some great grab lunch or dinner with him and he's been so generous to share, um, his, uh, some of his wisdom and knowledge, um, with me. So, all right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to turn over to you and Eddie can share with us kind of his story and kind of trajectory where he went from working with these cool bands to get into where he's now had a lot of stuff landing on TV and commercials and uh, trailers and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to shut up and let Eddie take it away. So give us. Well, give well um, I mean, I started off as an artist, you know, uh, guy in the band, um, got three major label record deals as a guy in the band, uh, joined the band on Epic and then started, my own band, got a deal on Electra, and then started another band, got a deal on Island. Um, I went from there to producing artists, um, just because at that point, you know, I knew a lot of A&R people, and my demos were getting record deals, so people were like, oh, well, you know, you know, uh, we should start, uh, you know, actually, um, hold on a second, let me click this. Um, so we should start, um, you know, making different demos for different people. and. Uh, and hold on, let me. My phone is doing something weird. Uh, okay, cool. That's better. Okay, so so um, so after that, um, started producing records, um, getting you know finding unsigned bands and getting record deals. I produced a band called Fuel, produced a band Smile Empty Soul, produced Anthrax, uh, nine records for a band El Nino a lot of lot of metal bands lot lots of you know rock bands in general and then when the music industry started going a different direction 
in, you know, 2005, 2006. I started thinking of different ways to, uh, to reinvent myself. And I noticed, you know, a lot of bands I produced, um, their songs would end up on like the Resident Evil soundtrack or like Major League Baseball games. I was doing remixes for them. And we're actually making, uh, I was seeing that they were making all this money on sync. And I was like, man, you know, I should like, I should do this like with my own music. So I started like putting together little libraries of my own stuff. And by 2010, I was like, you know, the music business was really, by 2008, I was like, the music business really is like a different place. I want to reinvent myself as a composer. So it just so happened that at that time, um, one of my friends was starting a library. He asked me for tracks. He started placing my tracks and then, uh, you start snowballing. Once you start actually really getting into it, you get into it. People know you're getting into it. They hear your music. They hear you talking about it. You find opportunities. Like I was mixing this, uh, this hip hop group, or this hip hop guy and uh, artist. And he was like, Oh, I got to go to my job tomorrow. And I was like, Oh, what do you do? And he's like, Oh, I work at a music library. So I was like, Oh, you think your boss would like my stuff? Played him some tracks. He's like, Oh, we'd love it. Started doing stuff for him. Then, uh, I, you know, somebody, when I moved out to LA here, somebody, uh, somebody was a mutual friend that wanted me to score some just small movie he had. And I did it for like almost nothing. And he was like, oh my God, this stuff is so good. You really hooked me up. You know, I'm an editor, you know, wherever I go to edit, I'm going to tell them to fire your guy and hire you. So sooner or later, actually somebody did. So it was like, then I found myself doing custom promos where I was scoring two picture, which I wasn't, I wasn't real versed at, at that point, but I, I picked it up. I mean, now I've scored out, I don't know how many things to picture, I don't know, maybe hundreds, literally hundreds of promos from, you know, Judge Judy to NBC News to Today in New York to just, you know, whatever, you name it. And then when you're doing that, you know, your library just, your contacts just start growing and I could always even even though it's a different business than the the music business that I was in I still had credits that I could sort of parlay into well I worked with this band so give me a shot at like you know but I'm you know really eight years ago or ten years ago really just reinvented everything I do and it's I just been going from there you know I mean production music really is a great it's a great business right now. I mean, I, I like it better than producing because, you know, when you produce, you're only as good as uh, um, you're only as good as the artists that you produce. So if you produce a band, you know, you produce a band they're on the label, they got a great record deal. Everyone's into them. Everyone's psyched. This is like great. You put your heart, and your soul into the record. You write the songs on it with them. You you spend months making it. I mean, sure, you get paid, but, you know, the goal isn't to just get paid for making the record. The goal is for them to go on and be huge, you know? And then they, uh, you know, they play a, a, a tour showcase for the label, and uh, the lead singer of the band just tells the record label to go, you know what? And they're like, screw this band. And then you, it's done. It's like, that's it. Nobody's excited about the band anymore. Nobody's excited. And that's not your fault. It's like, it's like I, I did everything I could to make an amazing record. And now, like, in one show, the lead singer who's drunk off his ass has shelved that record. And now it's like, okay, well, there, there goes my shot on that one. So the good thing about production music is that, you know, if I do a track and people love it, that's great. You know, that's, you know, great for me. If people, you know, I do a track and people hate it, well, that's my fault too. And I can live with that. If, if I do some piece of music and it doesn't land or it doesn't get, you know, to the next level, that's cool. As long as I, I like being able to take responsibility for my own, you know, for my own success or failure. And it's hard when you're producing a band because you're basically, for lack of a better word, in a marriage with those people or that artist that you're producing. It's, it's their career. It's still their thing. If their manager decides, oh man, we're not happy on this label, we're gonna we're gonna pull up, you know, we're gonna pull the record from the label, and you're like, you sure you want to do that, dude? And they're like, yeah, man, screw these guys. And it's like, great, okay, great, you know, another 
another thing that completely out of my control, you know? Uh, relate to the being able to put the hustle in, put the work in, work on the craft, and then have ownership of it and really be able to, again, I like that. Like sometimes, you know, you, you, you pitch to something or someone and it just doesn't work. But you know you did your best and poured your heart into it. You're not relying on someone else for an extra thing to happen. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. And then, um, yeah, I'll hit a couple of questions that people have that are kind of, again, coming from the Make Pop Music uh, board. Um, and so I think this first question is great because I think this is the kind of stuff you touched on in your story. But um, I think a lot of young people coming up are very interested in looking at like the whole thing on like, how do you network? So, and the question just is, what's kind of your process for networking? And do you feel like, um, do you feel like stronger about when you're able to do like face-to-face -face type net networking where you're going to go in and sit down with someone and build that relationship face-to-face? -face? Or do you think someone who lives who knows where that's really hustling, can you do it? via email and you know back and forth like that what do you think about the networking thing totally i mean look with the exception of you know one of my buddies who've been my best friend for 30 years that is the ceo of a big library now who well, obviously I, I face to face we were kicking it around in bars you know 30 years ago not knowing that either one of us was going to be in this world together besides him um a lot of the libraries that i work with they're here and I don't even see them. They, I, you know, I mean, look, for me, everybody in, in my world that I work with is actually a friend of mine. Whether they're a friend of mine because they became a friend of mine, because they started doing stuff for their companies, or they were a friend of mine. So, you know, I just had lunch with a buddy of mine in the big library this afternoon, and, you know, uh, or two, two of my buddies, because not, that yeah, wasn't a business lunch. We're, we had lunch because we're friends. Hold on a second. My my monitor turned off and it, it made me dark. Okay, hold on a second. So um we you know, we had lunch because we're friends. And and that's the cool thing about being in LA or New York or wherever, but I think that um you can be very you can do very well um and not be anywhere near your clients. You know, one of my one of my main companies that I, I do the custom stuff for um they're in LA here and I haven't physically seen them in about a year and a half you know so um I think you can do it from anywhere and, and the whole thing is that you know there are a lot of events that you go to but from my experience a lot of those events um unless you're at like a certain place they don't really do that that much for you like you'll go meet all these people and they'll be like, yeah, dude, send me some stuff, send me some stuff. And you never hear back from them ever again. And it's not, it's not because they're not cool. It's just because they're just busy. They're, they're busy with all the people they know, you know? So it's like, it's hard for them to start branching out. So um, I, I don't think it's important to, to have face to face. If you can, that's great. But Yeah, that's good. That's good. And then, um, this is like a, kind of like a three-part question. I got a couple things on here. Um, this is Adams asking some of these questions. And uh, he's asking, so when you're working on something for a sync um, and you're like uh, aiming it for like a certain show, do you look for uh, like what you think the music supervisor or the people in charge um are really looking for or you, uh, he's asking like if you recommend i guess it's kind of in a sense do you recommend trying to get into a music supervisor's brain and look for like what they're looking for and trying to specifically create things for you know it's almost like they have a need and you're trying to throw them something they can catch how much do you spend really thinking about I'm going to shape this because I know this is what they're going to like or a music supervisor is going to like or something. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any really way of telling what a, a supervisor is going to like unless they specifically call you up and say, 
hey, I'm looking for this. I need I need a piece like this and something like that and like this. And it needs to be like sort of fast because the scene's like this. And let me send you the scene. Or then you you do something specifically for them. But if I'm not writing specifically for a supervisor that contacts me, um, I mean, there's so many music supervisors out there. So you can't you can't guess what uh, unknown. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. guess what an unknown um, end person is gonna they're gonna want or what they like because I know supervisors that are on so many different types of of projects that it's not like this is the thing they do. I mean, it's not like oh, that person only does music supervision for orchestra stuff and this guy's that's the music supervisor the rock one they're not like that it's like whatever whatever they're supervising you could have one movie and have like if, if you're talking about supervisors for movies i mean have many different genres of music within you know you, you, it could be a movie about a biker gang and they could walk into a you know uh, a party and they could be playing a polka in the party so what are you going to be like? Well, you know, they might be looking for the polka music in the party. You know, I've had supervisors say to me, oh, this, these people walk into a club and there's a karaoke thing going on. They're doing an 80s disco track. We need an 80s disco track to be playing while they're in the bar. But the movie is like, you know, dead cool. You know, not dead, it's dead cool. But you know what I'm saying? The movie has nothing to do with 80s disco. Yeah. So, I just got 80s disco like a week ago from someone and I whipped up a, a disco track. That's making a comeback. I know. That's funny you bring up 80s disco because I'm like, oh, man. Actually, I feel like I've had seen two things lately where they were looking for uh, old sounding disco. But um, so next question. Um, this is kind of a good one, too. How much when you're producing tracks for a specific TV show or movie or a spot, um, do you, do you are you conscious of creating a track that like voices could go over or that is easy to place like do you specifically work on your tracks to make them better or easier to use underneath let's say a person talking or something like that well okay that's like such a like when you say creating music for a tv show like a specific show like, are you like scoring that show because you know if you're scoring that show that's a lot different if you're creating music that you hope will get a placement in a tv show first of all when you're compute composing music for like libraries and stuff like that like you you don't really know what shows i mean some companies i work with you know they have a bigger um presence in certain types of shows but I mean, when you're delivering library music, I mean, you're delivering a main mix, uh, uh, narrative mix, uh, instrumental, you know, pure instrumental mix, or, you know, you're, you're giving them so many different mixes and stems that um, if, if I, I'd write the melody line, let them use the, the mix without the melody line. It's like, it's like I wouldn't purposely not write a melody line in the song thinking, oh, well, they're going to use this, you know, underneath dialogue. If I'm scoring, if, if somebody, you know, gives me a custom piece and I'm scoring two picture for a client and there's a VO going on, sure, I work around the VO, but I know where to drop things out because I have the VO and I have the picture and I'm cutting to the actual, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making my piece of music fit with the picture. But that's a whole custom thing. So sure, if you're scoring, you know, the Good Wife, you, of course you're working around the thing. But you're scoring to the show. You're not, you know, you're composing the show. You're not a, a library. You know what I mean? So that's a very specific thing. It's, if I was creating quote unquote just production music for sync, I would just create whatever song you're going to create, and then you'll have all the alternate mixes and then let them tell you, oh, well, you know, we're going to use the mix without the, well, they wouldn't even tell you. you. You'll see it. You see the thing of air. You know, you'll see the, um, oh, they use just the drum track. That's great. You know how many songs I have?
that um, on the cue sheets and on my royalty statements, they're using like the DR version, which is just the drums. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, like, hey, you know, it's like the same amount of money. Well, yeah, and it's like they're in the, it. I always say, you know, there's a need. There's like you're creating something, and there's a need. You're trying to fill a need. You're trying to fill a spot, like that they that they want something there. And if it's the drums, you know, that's you got something there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it could be the bass. It could be whatever. You know, the bottom line is that when you're creating music for sync or you're creating music for anything, whatever you're doing in your life, remember that what you're actually creating, the goal is for somebody to listen to it. Like I think people forget that you're making music. So if you're doing a song for sync, you might say to yourself, well, what can I actually see this in? Like, can I imagine, like what TV show in existence could I actually imagine my song in? And if you're like, I can't imagine any show, then you know, you're probably not gonna have that much success with the song. Cause if you can't even imagine it in the show, and how's somebody else gonna find your song and be like, oh my God, this is perfect for Vampire Diaries. It's like, so, and I'm not saying you should write a song specifically for a show. You could though, but I'm not saying you should, but always look back at what you're writing. Even if you're trying to be a recording artist, even if you're like, you know, uh, a recording artist, you're like, is somebody actually gonna listen to this song in their car and blast it up and drive down the highway? Or because somebody gonna listen to this, you know, like, you create music obviously for yourself, but you also create it for people to listen to, you know, for TV, you're really creating music to be on TV or film. Yeah. I like to, I always think of it like, um, it's like a feel sometimes more what they're, that there's like a show or a movie or a scene or a car commercial or whatever it is. And they're looking for like a certain type of feeling to match the visual. They have a visual, they want something to someone to feel something when they see it. So if they hear a song that has that feeling in it, that matches what they see, and those two things go together, that's the win-win. It's like that's where your song, you know, fits in. Um, here's another question, um, just kind of with today's shifting musical landscape, and I think it's interesting. Is like so many people, like now this whole licensing and sync thing has got to be a big deal. We were just talking about that earlier. It's like, you know, there's people that are doing courses, <laughs> you know, doing programs and all this stuff to like, hey, here you can be successful doing sync. But so there's a lot of people jumping in, I feel like, to this uh, I agree. kind of way. I agree. So I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of people, um, you know, look, it's with anything else. You're selling the dream. You're selling the... You know, uh, uh, you know, you can be like me type of thing. And, you know, a lot of times just like, you know, a course just doesn't, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to think that people take some courses and stuff and do all kinds of stuff and they get, you know, they get a lot of work out of it and it works out for them and it's great. I just don't hear that many of those successful stories. I hear, it seems like people that take these courses take the courses and then they think that qualifies them to give somebody else a course. And then they give a course. And they have no <clears throat> practical real life experience of anything. They just can give a course because they're parroting what they heard off of another course. And to me, it's like, it's like, it's like a Ponzi scheme. It's like you're selling widgets, you know? But anyway, what were you saying, Sam? I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, you. okay. No, but that was perfect. This springboards into this question of, so uh, if there's someone who's... Uh, with this musical landscape and so many people just pushing themselves into sync. Um, so there's someone who's a newbie. I'm making tracks. I feel like I'm getting the quality up there. I feel like I'm really getting this dialed in. Um, I listen to this and what other stuff is getting licensed and I feel like I'm right there, but I'm, but I'm at the beginning of this journey. What would be some advice you'd have to someone to get to a place, point like yourself where stuff is landing on you know different shows what's what would advice would you give to kind of get to that place well i'd always say work on everything i mean look the beautiful thing about sync is that you don't have to write the latest coolest trendiest beat to get on tv i mean i have a 90s library i did with like you know 90s-esque songs that 
I just got one of them on uh, Young Sheldon. I mean, it's like you could do, you could be doing all kinds of stuff. You, I have this swing disc, like music from the 50s that has done well for me, you know, funk from the 70s. So that's the cool thing is you don't need to do the trendy thing. I would always say that don't always, you know, rely on work to be working, if that makes sense. When I first started out, I, if I had nothing to do, I just made music and I figured I'll figure it out. I'll do all these tracks. I'll figure it out. And then I started figuring it out. Then it was like, I'm mean, look, I'm at a point now that I don't do anything except to have a specific purpose for it. I have a purpose for every single song that I do. People call me up and go, oh, you got a track laying around like this? Nope. Every single one of my tracks is taken with the company. And I have over 2,000 tracks with ASCAP. So it's like every single track is taken with the company. Every single track is out there in their own little world trying to make a way for themselves. And, um, but when I, you know, when I first got into this, I didn't, I didn't know of any places. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I knew that I had tracks, remixes that I did for bands that were on like the Resident Evil soundtrack and, and car commercials and it's coffee commercials and all these things. But those were really their tracks that I got paid to do a, a remix of. So I knew that there were companies that did things. I, I mean, I didn't know anything like what I know now. I didn't know how these, these things worked. I didn't know what they needed. And I learned along the way. But um, I would say just make music. Just keep making music all the time. Like, do what I say. Is give yourself a spec deal. Give yourself a development deal. Instead of going out and finding, you know, if you want to get into sync, instead of going out and finding some mix to do that, you know, for exposure or something, Write a song and mix your own song. You know what I mean? Because, look, it's like you talked about sync. You know, look, when I was growing up, when you went to the music store and you saw a keyboard, okay, when you bought that keyboard on the box, they had some pictures, like some guy like rocking out on, on the cover of it, and there's like a crowd in the stadium, they're rocking out. Now when you buy a keyboard in the store, on the side of it, it says perfect for film and television. So it's like, that's where it's become. and. This world, I mean, I got into it 10 years ago when it was sort of competitive. And I got into it coming from the record business with a lot of credits. Now, it's on a different level of competitive. Because so many people have figured out, oh, my God, we can make money in sync. And, and record companies have figured out, hey, we can get an Ariana Grande song in that new Lincoln car commercial. And she'll make good money. So now you're, you're like, in it, right? So, so it's... The bar has really raised. If you listen to people's cues from like 2000 or 2001 and you listen to them now, you know, I mean, I'm mixing library tracks at the level that I mix major label records. You know, so it's like, you, you got to bring it now. You can't just say, oh, it's just production music. Nobody cares. Trust me, you're going to try to get a, you know, 10, 15, 20, 50, 75,000 dollars sink. Believe me, there's going to be some competition. It's not just going to be like, oh, sure. Like, you're the only guy who, who did this. You're so lucky. Nobody else, nobody else tried to do this $100,000 coffee commercial. So you're the guy. We can't find anybody else. You're lucky. You're like, that's, there's 10,000 people shooting on that brief. Yeah, hey, and then uh, we got another great question from my friend Tamara. What's up? Um, she says, uh, how thin do you spread your catalog? Same tracks with multiple libraries? No. A few no. different tracks at each library, so your songs are exclusive to each library? The days, the days of what they call uh, re -life, re renaming, um, repurposing tracks are over. People do it. I mean, look, if, if you're dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's, maybe you can start sharing the French fries, you know? But if you're going with bigger companies, they all want exclusivity. Any library that's going to pay you up front for tracks is going to want exclusivity. It's bad business not to do exclusivity. Unless I have certain companies that have said to me, hey, you know, I know you got these high-end songs laying around. Can I use your songs? I, I, um, 
I don't need to be exclusive on them. I just want to know, do you have 20 guys with this? Or how many people have this? And are they in my world? Like, I have a buddy that has a bunch of my songs non-exclusive, and he's like a TV guy. Doesn't really do anything in film. That's not his thing. Then I have a guy that has the same songs, but they are only advertising agencies. They don't mess with TV. Then I have someone who has them only film, doesn't mess with TV, and they all know that the other one has the tracks. Um, I started with a library that I signed a non-exclusive deal for my music with them, but I still gave them the music exclusively because it's bad business. It's bad business, and you know, just think about it. You got two guys pitching the same song for the same spot. It's a small world. It's way more of a small world than people understand. They have no idea when you're really in this world, how many people you know, and they know your name, and they start calling up people. You get a guy from a major network calling up a lamber. Hey, I see Eddie's got this track, man. It sounds just like your track. Like, what's up with that? And then my guys call me, hey, what's up with that, man? This track, like, I know we didn't do an exclusive deal on it, but dude, I've been repping this track. I've been getting you all, all these placements on it. And what do you mean, my, my competition has a track too? So, I mean, people can do what they want. And I know a lot of companies that are more of like, you know, royalty free and whatever, they, they do this non-exclusive thing. And they all, it, for me, it's bad business. All my, my tracks are in specific places. I, I have 10 different companies I work with or so, and then little things here and there. And, you know, I, I work with a lot of co-writers. So sometimes let's say I write a song with Sam and he goes, ah, can we use this for my buddy's library? Sure. And I've never worked with the library before, but he has. So, in, you know, including my co-writers, I probably have music in about 20 libraries. But just on my own, I have my own little world. But but that's the whole thing is that, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. And I wouldn't use sample based uh, things, not to bad mouth splice or anything like that. It's a great, great place if you're making artist records. But I'd be very careful about using like melodic loops off of Splice. Because let's say you do, you know, do a track exclusively and, and for a company, and that company gets your track as the theme for, you know, the, the, the NBA finals, okay, or something, you know, whatever. And you sign a deal with them exclusively, and they're giving you like a nice five figure sync up in the high in the five figures. And they've got your track exclusively and all the stems. And that stem is a horn loop from Splice. It's a, it's a piano loop. How do, you, how, do you, how do you sign that off exclusively to somebody? You know? And then somebody can just take their phone and shazam your track. And like 80,000 people come up writing it. So um, as far as sample-based stuff, I mean you should really layer the hell out of it. A lot of times the contracts that you're going to get from these libraries are going to ask you, are you using samples? Where are your samples from? Can I have a copy of the agreement with the sample company? It's a little different if you're doing an Ariana Grande song and you're using some splice loop or something because it's, it's part of a, a song with her and it's, it's a different thing. But if you're doing production music, I, I, would, I would play all your stuff. Play all your instruments. Here's another good question um, from Tamara again. Um, so with having all that music out there, you have so much music out there. Uh, she asks, like, uh, back to, like, what you were saying about Shazamming something. Do you use, like, a mechanism like TuneSat to know if someone is using your music out there just to no. filter through to make sure you're getting covered for everything you're... I have, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends that use TuneSat. Um, I was thinking about it. I don't. Um, I talked to some library friends about it, and they said, as a composer, it can be a mess using TuneStat because of um, a lot of different reasons. And them, I, I you know, I, I don't use it, so I don't know all the details of it. But they were just saying that they didn't think it was a good idea because you might get like fake doubles and stuff. I just honestly, look, it, it's an imperfect system until everything's really properly watermarked out there. Um, I just rely on my, my PROs to get me, 
it's in their best interest to to collect their money too and it's it's in the library's best interest because you know 99% of the libraries out there um, are taking your publishing share and you have your writer's share that that 99% um, I worked with one company that didn't do that and that's because I had some pull but that's how they make money if they're not yeah. taking your publishing then why are they doing this just for fun you know yes. so the bottom line is that if if you're not getting paid then they're not getting paid and they're a big company they have tune stat and all that they deal with all that stuff that's it's not up to me to say hey buddy we had a we had a placement in brazil like i don't see it where the hell is it why don't you go out they get a whole office building of people doing that you know but i wouldn't i wouldn't tell people not to do it you should do what you want i, I don't know that much about it but i, I don't hmm. personally do it. um here's a good question too and like this probably leans more towards someone like myself of uh how does like an artist or a band or let's say like i you know like i'm producing stuff in here and i'll get a co-writer and we get kind of a side project going again this is stuff that has a vocal over it and stuff like that and maybe we're putting it on spotify and different things like that um the question is how does a band shop their songs to sync uh, and and how is that different? Like, because you work with some bands and and you work with some music that's got like a singer over it, and you know, is it kind of more of an artist type track? So how is that maybe different than throwing and chopping and you know the the orchestral or the score type stuff? It's all the same. It's all the same. I mean, you know, I do full songs. It's like I, I'm just saying this afternoon. Like a lot of times, if you have a song the vocals might be the thing that made the person, you know, um, like the track and then they take the vocals out. Like I, I had a, I just did a Ford commercial recently with the library. Um, that was, it was, it was picked out of the library. I, it wasn't scored. It was just, you know, they picked it. And I have feeling that the reason why they went with the song is because of the lyrical content. And then when the song got licensed, the lyrics aren't in it, you know, but, but the whole thing is that that attracted them to it. That gave them the vibe that, you know, for the music. But um, it's like anything else, you know. What bands have to remember is that if they want to, you know, shop their music for sync, um, they better be in control of their masters. They better be able to make different versions of it and stems and, you know, be able to if they're going for higher level stuff, be able to customize it. I mean, can't tell you how many times I've done projects with people. I mean, I always am control the masters because I'm a workaholic. So it's like, I know that I'm not going to be going up for a hike in the mountains for 10 hours one day. And sorry, just missed the, just missed it. You know, a Starbucks ad because I was hiking. So it's like, <laughs> I, I'll get called one o'clock in the morning and be like, dude, you know, you, you track, you're going to get the track and blah, 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 blah. It's going to be on whatever. Can you take the bing, bing, bing? Just take take that out of it. Can you just get that out of it? I know that you gave me the stems, but in the stems, that's married to the the synth track too, and we we want the synth track. So and and I'll get out of bed and fire up the studio and take the bing, bing, bing out of the track and send it over to them. You know, so um, that's the thing about bands if they're real bands. Now you know, Sam obviously you know there's real bands, there's fake bands, there's bands that are licensing guys like me that get together with their friends and they form a band with a band name and you know it's a lot of fun and album art and we go for sync deals and then there's bands that are on tour all the time and have no way of being able to make modifications and tracks sometimes they're in a studio sometimes now they have a producer because they don't know how to use the computer and and they, they got to call the producer to make the thing with the stem so now you know, someone's going to call you, then you call the band, and then the band calls the producer, and the producer needs to get the file from the engineer. It's like, forget it. You're, you're already over. So bands, real bands sometimes are dangerous. Um, if you're going to work with real bands, you have to make sure you get all the tracks in your control. And if they say, oh, that record's 10 years old. I don't have the tracks. They, they got them at the studio. Cool. <laughs> but, um, you know, you go about it any, any, the same way. I mean, the people that handle my orchestral stuff also handle 
my country songs. They also handle my rock songs. They also handle hip hop. It's not like uh, these guys just do orchestral stuff. Yeah, awesome, man. That's all super helpful, super, super great stuff. And yeah, I, I feel like coming back full circle, it's just like, like it all kind of revolves around uh, getting good at your craft and your art and what you do, like refining it, making it like good stuff that people can connect with. Um, and again, if you're going to really plug in where you're like doing a lot of this stuff, like you said, sticking around the studio and making sure you can work quickly, it all seems to happen so fast. Like the couple of things that I've landed, it seems like they need it. And all of a sudden it's got to be this, this and that. And you got to get it back to them. Like you said, super quick or they're uh, moving on. Um, yeah, I've had ridiculous deadlines on things. <laughs> I've had ridiculous deadlines on things. I, I scored, actually rebranded the network. It was the biggest single gig I ever did. It's 259 deliverables. And I had spreadsheets of literally what the modifications were, a main theme, shoulder themes, integrated teasers, you name it. And it, it was a lot of work. Now, obviously, you know, the people who were the middleman in the deal helped me a lot as far as um, the opinions on stuff. And But, um, I mean, it was up to me to uh, do it myself. And all these things were, you know, when these people say they have deadlines, they mean they have deadlines. They mean that they have a meeting with the boss and they're going to play them the five tracks on Monday. And he, if you don't have those tracks to them by – you know, one o'clock on Monday, so they can go into the boss, boss and do their presentation. You know, I, I've done promos for major networks that had to be turned on a Friday because they were airing on Saturday. So, like, literally that. You know, so. Um, crazy. That's crazy. real. Yeah. Deadlines are real. part of the job. The deadlines are just as important as creating good music. I mean, you can create the best track in the world, but if you're a day short, a day late on a campaign, you know, doesn't matter. Yeah. No, this stuff's great, great, all great. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. I think we hit, like, uh, let me just make sure here. We hit a lot of these questions, and, um, yeah, I know I've just appreciated uh, – you're when you're able to chime in on Facebook on people's questions like on the on the making pop music board or um e even just like I've ran into people and that know you and they're like man Eddie's helped me here helped me there so it's it's awesome I feel like 22 years ago when I started this there was a lot of guys working in the music industry that didn't want to tell anyone kind of what they were doing or give them much advice it was like everyone was kind of holding on to those secrets and the things they knew because they were afraid if they spread it out to everyone. So I, I love the community now. I think it's been so great to have guys like you. And um, I feel like I've made a bunch of friends here in, in LA that, that um, are, are so generous with like giving advice and wisdom and like kind of a, a path and a trajectory to help, you know, them, you know, follow along a trail as well in their own path um yeah i'm looking and see i don't see uh um oh here's a good one uh maybe we can end on on a question like this um which contacts have benefited you the most um is it more like relationships with um the people maybe uh on the side that are able to edit and put it into shows or direct music soups or with an agency i mean i think i know the answer to this but what, what are the relationships you were like, I couldn't be doing this without this, you know, kind of link, this connection, right? Well, I mean, it really is all of them, but, but I would say the agencies. I mean, you know, I mean, supervisors can do great things for you, but, you know, um, it's a lot more specific. You know, I mean, if you have a music supervisor really championing you, and every time they have um, a project, they call you and only you up. And they have the ability to take your track and to put it through into a project, then that's going to be great. You know, I mean, I have a couple of connections that way. People that 
will come to just me for a brief and they'll, you know, but I usually have to turn it around that day. I've scored, I scored music and major, major motion pictures that way. Um, but the whole thing is that um, you, 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 you got to play every single direction. If you're going to be successful in this world, you got to do it all. You can't just be like, oh, I only do this. I only do that. I only do, just do it all. Do it all. But, but I would say agents, libraries, you know, publishers, that's, that's where the bulk of, you know, things come from. Unless you're lucky enough to get into custom music. I mean, my, my main income is actually from custom post scoring, not from library music. Although, you know, I do okay with library music. That's, I'm, I'm more, you know, I get the picture and I score to the picture and only I get the picture and score to it. It's not a, it's not a cattle call brief where we're all pitching. I don't, I don't pitch like that. How, how, can I ask like how in this whole kind of journey that you went through, how long did it take you to get to that point where you had people trusting you with picture to be able to create the music? Like it's, I mean, like, like I, I haven't got to do that yet. So I'm like, you know, a couple rungs back on the ladder. But um, how, how, what's the, has that been something you've been doing for years and years or has that been something more recent? No, I've been, I've been post scoring to picture for about seven years. Hmm. Um, I, I was into production music for about two years when I had the opportunity or three years when I had the opportunity to score a picture. But I was in the music business at that point for about 18 years mm. or 16 years. I'd already had lots of record sales as a record producer. So um, I was already, you know, well versed in it, but you're know, scoring to picture. I mean, I know a lot of composers that kill it in the library world, like really kill it in the library world. And they, they have they come over to my studio and like dude how did you like how did you even get the tempo to that like how did you know how to where to make the beats change and like why like where did you how did you figure out how to make that a 30 or 15 or five like what how did you and it's like you just feel it you look at the picture you get a feel for the picture you practice you know you look with different tempos you think what, what works what doesn't work and you start composing music for it and the good thing is because these gigs I'm not pitching for, I can send a very rough drum and piano track over to the company and say, is this along the lines? And they'll be like, nah, it should be guitar. And then bass and guitar. They'll go back and do it with the guitar. And they'll be like, that, that's it, do it. And I'll develop that. You know, a lot of times they're like, well, we don't fully know, but we think you're in the right. So it's not like you're doing this brief all day and you do, you spend hours on this thing and you got it, you send it off, you never heard anything ever again. I'm dealing directly, you know. I mean, once you're actually scoring to the, the actual picture, most of the time you're a little bit further down the line than, uh, you know. But, I mean, I've seen a lot of briefs come along where they show you the picture too. But this is, these aren't really, um, they're not briefs. They're, they specifically have requested me doing the gig. And that takes a while. It takes a while. It takes building your name up. It takes having successes. It has, you know, you do a track and good things happen with that commercial. The campaign does well. It translates. Maybe it wins some awards. It does something, you know. And, and that company is very excited to use you again. You know, that's, that's the trick to the music business in general is return clients. I've been working with the same people now. I, I've been producing a band for 18 years. I've made seven records for them, eight records for them over the course of 18 years. You know, I worked with a band. I made six or seven records for another band. Like most artists I work with and libraries and clients, they stay, they keep me in their world their whole, their whole career. I mean, I've been doing custom postcards since one company for nine years. I'm the only person they use. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the hmm. owner of the company is like truly a friend of mine at this point. Like we talk about going out to dinner together. Like it's not business. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Relationships. You, know, you go through battles with these people because, you, you know, the client is still the person that you're trying to please. 
you know? So even if you're dealing with a library or a production company or an ad agency, they're not, they're not the end user. They're on your team, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. And it's trust. People trust me and such. So, yeah. All right. We got one last question. Veronica wants to know, what is your favorite sushi roll? <laughs> oh, we lost him. Oh, he's back. I know, I'm, I'm back. I'm sorry. My, my phone was just blowing up, and I'm on my phone, so I keep declining the calls. <laughs> um, hold on a second. Uh, my favorite sushi roll. I like sushi more as sushi than as rolls. So, um, like, I, I, I'm not big on the rolls. I like, I like bluefin, I like toro, uh, albacore, salmon. And then, you know, at Nobu, like just about everything. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. We have to grab some sushi next time. You're always posting those pictures. In a, oh, Tamara says uh, sashimi is, uh, is where it's at. I um, love sashimi, especially, uh, well, that's like sashimi you want to have, like, you know, it really, like, no boo, or like, like high-end places, because then they do it well. But I love sashimi. I mean. I'm a, I'm a wussy uh, sushi eater. I, I get, like, California rolls or crunch rolls or something like that. Don't throw anything at me. Sorry. Uh, I didn't grow California up eating California rolls, I mean, so. I'm not sure if that's actually sushi. It probably but, uh, isn't. You know, that's like, that's like getting a steak at the sushi restaurant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Um, hey, yeah, I think, man, this is so good. We like hit an hour right here. Wow. We, uh, we went for it and gosh, I, I got a lot um, out of it and it's, it's like always would, great to hear your story and like, yeah. I would just say one thing in closing. Yeah. If you're do a composer it. out there and you really want to get into licensing, and you want to get into licensing and, and not, I mean, I, I'm, it's still a hard road. Um, try to write for a bigger composer. Try mm -hmm. to write with him. Usually it's done with splits. But at least you can get in the door with their, compo with their connections. You have their name associated with your tracks. So editors see their name. And they, oh, this guy, he wrote this for me. He wrote that. Try to get a bunch of different composers that you can write for. It's not that you don't have to be loyal like one guy, right, for one guy. Try to get a bunch of different guys that are established in the game. Let them hear your tracks. See if they're interested to do co-writes. Co-writes might mean you do all the heavy lifting, you send them the track, and they mix it. They do the cut downs. They do the stems. But, you know, I know with the co-writers that I work with, a lot of those guys will do a track in three or four hours. And a lot of times it'll take me three hours to mix and do all the stems and all the stuff and I'm shopping it. So I would say if you want to get into libraries, you can start sending out emails to everybody you know and, and trying to get with companies and, and you could. It's tough nowadays. It is equally as tough to get with composers, but most guys I know that are composers, at least they're like most of the time they'll get back to you. And tell you, oh, your tracks aren't ready yet, or they're great, or let's do this or that. With some libraries, you send them emails to you blue in the face, and you'll never hear anything back from them. They'll, it's like you didn't even send them an email. And it, it, it's because it's very competitive. And like I said, they already have 6,000 composers that they're actually dealing with that were brought into them in different ways and have worked their way up the ladder. And now they have their own, they have their own discs, and they're just trying to deal with them. So I'd say... Because my number one question people ask me is, how do I get into production music? What do I do? And that's the best way to do it. Just yeah, and I think, I think that kind of carries over. I get asked, like, how, as a singer-songwriter, can I get my music on a TV show or a car commercial or something like that? And um, I would almost say what you just said for the composing side has a similar message on that end of it too is write up, write with people, try to see, yeah. you know, if you have other songwriters or different people around you that have had success. Um, I have a good friend that I've known for years, Tyrone. His music is on TV and movies and sports and stuff and like you. over like and big... over and over. Yeah, he's, he's like just killing it. And so, you know, humbly I, 
uh, text him, hey, can we get in a co-write sometime, <laughs> you know, please work, you know, let's, let's do something together. And you know, you'd be surprised, those people, you know, you can learn so much from uh, composing with someone else or writing, co-writing with someone else. Just getting in the same room is like people that are successful in doing it, uh, you can't go wrong with that. It's just, no, you're going to, you move up with other people at the same time. It's the best way to do it. It's just, you know, I know a lot of people that are like, all oh, my music's precious. I don't want to, you know, split with people. So I, I tell everybody I know, I'd rather have 50% of 100 than 100% of 50. <laughs> I've made my whole career that way. I've made my whole career that way. And that's great. So you know, I've, I've been, you know, self-employed through music for, over 20 years you know way well over 20 years and still you know doing just as well or better than i was doing at any point in that so i, I you know to me it's like you know a couple of words you live by are always in the project well and and work with people that you know or in the place that you want to be a lot of times just if you want to produce ariana grande see if you can intern for whoever produced her last single you know what i mean i mean sure that sounds very simple but you know sometimes it is that simple yeah sometimes it is yeah you know, sometimes it's not you know yeah but anyways thank you thank you thank you for just everything and it's it's uh it's i think good education it's good encouragement it's good reality check sometimes it's a lot of work and it's like it's not that it's not you know it is not like someone can't get there anyone can get there it's the push yeah. and drive and the writing on the you know the wisdom of the people that have come before you and done it already so and so again thank you for sharing all that uh stuff with us and uh yeah i hope i hit everyone's questions and stuff and we'll post the link up too and again yeah eddie Woo. thank you so much thank you for having me it was fun Anytime. yeah yeah all right, and thank you for everyone hanging out too uh, live with us on Zoom. And that's it. All right, peace out, everyone. I'll see you later. See you later.